Welcome back, friends. I'm Annabelle, and I am here to read. Every week we take a work of classic literature and we read it together. And then we talk about it and discuss it, because I just happen to have a lot of opinions about everything. If you would like to follow along, down in the video description box there's a link to a free ebook, as well as other important source links, a link to the author's bios down there too. And while you're down there, you might as well subscribe, because it's down there and you're down there, so... <laughs> Why, why not? Tonight we are reading Orpheus and Eurydice from Edith Hamilton's Mythology. The very earliest musicians were the gods. Athena was not distinguished in that line, but she invented the flute, although she never played upon it. Hermes made the lyre and gave it to Apollo, who drew from it sounds so melodious that when he played in Olympus, the gods forgot all else. Hermes also made the shepherd pipe for himself, and drew enchanting music from it. Pan made the pipe of reed, which can sing as sweetly as the nightingale in spring. The muses had no instrument peculiar to them, but their voices were lovely beyond compare. Next in order came a few mortals so excellent in their art that they almost equaled the divine performers. Of these by far the greatest was Orpheus. On his mother's side he was more than mortal. He was the son of one of the Musans and a Thracian prince. His mother gave him the gift of music, and Thrace, where he grew up, fostered it. The Thracians were the most musical of all the peoples of Greece, but Orpheus had no rival there or anywhere except the gods alone. There was no limit to his power when he played and sang. No one and nothing could resist him. In the deep, still woods upon the Thracian mountains, Orpheus, with his singing lyre, led the trees, led the wild beasts of the wilderness. Everything inanimate and animate followed him. He moved the rocks on the hillside and turned the courses of the rivers. Little is known about his life before his ill-fated marriage, for which he is even better known than for his music, but he went on one famous expedition and proved himself a most useful member of it. He sailed with Jason on the Argo, and when the heroes were weary or the rowing was especially difficult, he would strike his lyre, and they would be aroused to fresh zeal, and their oars would smite the sea together in time to the melody. Or if a quarrel threatened, he would play so tenderly and soothingly that the fiercest spirits would grow calm and forget their anger. He saved the heroes, too, from the sirens, when they heard far over the sea singing so enchantingly sweet that it drove out all other thoughts except a desperate longing to hear more, and then they turned the ship to the shore where the sirens sang, Orpheus snatched up his lyre and played a tune so clear and ringing that it drowned the sound of those lovely, fatal voices. The ship was put back on her course, and the winds sped her away from the dangerous place. If Orpheus had not been there, the Argonauts, too, would have left their bones on the siren's island. Where he first met, and how he wooed the maiden he loved, Eurydice we are not told, but it is clear that no maiden he wanted could have resisted the power of his song. They were married, but their joy was brief. Directly after the wedding, as the bride walked in a meadow with her bridesmaids, a viper stung her, and she died. Orpheus's grief was overwhelming. He could not endure it. He determined to go down into the world of death and try to bring Eurydice back. He said to himself, With my song I will charm Demeter's daughter, I will charm the lord of the dead, moving their hearts with my melody, I will bear her away from Hades. He dared more than any other man ever dared for his love. He took the fearsome journey to the underworld. There he struck his lyre, and at the sound all that vast multitude were charmed to stillness. The dog Cerberus relaxed his guard, the wheel of Ixion stood motionless, Sisyphus sat at rest upon his stone. Tantalus forgot his thirst. For the first time, the faces of the dread goddesses of the Furies were wet with tears. The ruler of Hades drew near to listen with his queen. Orpheus sang, O gods who rule the dark and silent world, to you all born of a woman needs must come. All lovely things at last go down to you. You are the debtor who is always paid. A little while, we tarry up on earth, then we are yours for ever and ever. But I seek one who came to you too soon. The bud was plucked before the flower bloomed. I tried to bear my lost, I could not bear it. Love was too strong, a god. 
O oh, king, you know, if that old tale men tell is true, how once the flowers saw the rape of Proserpina. Then weave again for sweet Eurydice life's pattern that was taken from the loom too quickly. See, I ask a little thing, only that you will lend, not give her to me. She shall be yours when her year's span is full. No one under the spell of his voice could refuse him anything. He drew iron tears down Pluto's cheek and made hell grant what love did seek. They summoned Eurydice and gave her to him, but upon one condition, that he would not look back at her as she followed him until they reached the upper world. So the two passed through the great doors of Hades to the path which would take them out of the darkness, climbing up and up. He knew that she must be just behind him, but he longed unutterably to give one glance to make sure. But now they were almost there. The blackness was turning gray. Now he had stepped out joyfully into the daylight. Then he turned to her. It was too soon. She was still in the cavern. He saw her in the dim light, and he held out his arms to clasp her, but on the instant she was gone. She had slipped back into the darkness. All he heard was one faint word. Farewell. Desperately, he tried to rush after her and follow her down, but he was not allowed. The gods would not consent to his entering the world of the dead a second time while he was still alive. He was forced to return to the earth alone in utter desolation. Then he forsook the company of men. He wandered through the wild solitudes of Thrace, comfortless except for his lyre, playing, always playing, and the rocks and the rivers and the trees hurt him gladly, his only companions. But at last a band of maenads came upon him. They were as frenzied as those who killed Pentheus so horribly. They slew the gentle musician, tearing him limb from limb, and flung the severed head into the swift river Hebrus. It was borne along past the river's mouth onto the lesbian shore, nor had it suffered any change from the sea when the muses found it and buried it in the sanctuary of the island. His limbs they gathered and placed in a tomb at the foot of Mount Olympus, and there to this day the nightingales sing more sweetly than anywhere else. The End so I really wanted to pick a love story because it's almost Valentine's Day and uh, I don't think I understood the assignment. And we're, we're kind of bending the rules with this one because Edith Hamilton didn't, obviously she's not the progenitor of these stories, but she did translate them. So that kind of bucks the whole uh, public domain thing because translations are under the public domain. Um, but we're, said, we're celebrating 75 years of Edith Hamilton's mythology. So I think we're kind of safe here. So I picked this one because I wanted to talk about two things. One is Edith Hamilton's mythology and how that kind of like shapes stuff and whatever. And also the current trend to retell this particular story of Orpheus and Eurydice. So Edith Hamilton wasn't actually a writer. I mean, obviously she's a writer because she wrote this, but she was a classicist. She mostly did research about ancient Greece and ancient Rome and to some extent the Norse gods which is what's in her book. And you can tell that she really did her research because like in the preface to the Orpheus, Orpheus and Eurydice section, it talks about um, how it's told by Apollonius of Rhodes and then the rest of the story is from Virgil and Ovid. But she does that before all of the different sections in this. The reason she wrote this is because most people had an idea of the stories of ancient Rome and ancient Greece, but it was just kind of part of the cultural zeitgeist, you know, like how now you might know the story of Star Wars and even know a few lines. I am your father. Even if you had never watched the movie and had no interest in it, you know Star Wars, right? That's kind of what ancient Greece was to people back before, mostly now. <laughs> There were little, like, idiosyncrasies, little here and there, that weren't exactly codified. And Edith Hamilton's mythology really did that, and did that for a very wide audience, because her writing was both easy to understand and straightforward, and communicated the intricacies of the myths, but also it wasn't, like, it's interesting, it's a story, it's not 
you know, a recitation of, like, if I were to try and explain, like, oh, yeah, Orpheus' wife got bit by a snake and then they went down to the underworld and blah. Like, it's a story meant to be listened to or told or read or whatever. It's not stereo instructions. Although, I mean, even now we know, like, the Achilles heel and all that kind of thing. We think of Cupid for Valentine's Day. This story, Orpheus and Eurydice, is from a section of eight different love stories and none of them end happily. And this particular tale of Orpheus and Eurydice seems to pop up over and over again, like throughout the centuries in ways that we don't really see the other Greek myths and legends pop up. Like we see the whole like, oh, it's your Achilles heel. Like we see that kind of uh, idiomatic story pop up again and again. And um, to some, I, I do feel like we see uh, the Hades and Persephone uh, myth kind of come up too. Orpheus and Eurydice has been inspiration for poets and writers and whatever for ever and ever and ever. My One of my personal favorites is the Offenbach, and it's actually one of your favorites too, you just don't know it. Very recently we've seen two Greek myth-inspired works that both touch on the Orpheus and Eurydice myth in very different ways, and they're very interesting to contrast. One of them is Hades Town. Orpheus! She called his name before she went. You ready to see? Hades Town is a musical, and the central story is the Orpheus and Eurydice story. Which there's a whole lot of symbolism with the flowers, and because I mean Persephone is also there because it's you know Hades and Persephone, and um, so there's a lot of symbolism with flowers. But that's just kind of a straight retelling. Where So weirdly, the one that I find the most intriguing from a narrative standpoint is actually from Supergiant Games' Hades. So Hades, the video game, takes place well after the events that are described in the core of the myth. And Eurydice is stuck in Asphodel, the meadows where she's not really heroic. She didn't really do too much. All she did was, you know, get bit by a snake and go down into the underworld. So she's not in Elysium where all the warriors and great glorious heroes go. And she wasn't bad or anything. So she's not down in Tartarus being, you know, Tartarized for all eternity. So the way the developers interlocked their particular stories at that point is by having them sing the same song. The first time we hear it, we hear Eurydice singing it. No burdens, no further to be pain. It's all about saying farewell, and the title of the song is Good Riddance. So she's comforting these other souls that are stuck in Asphodel with her. What what happened happened. She let bygones be bygones, but at the same time, good riddance, my dude. And then we bring that song back to Orpheus, and he sings the same song, but he's very sad about it. Because he realizes that he's the one that's leaving her behind, and she's now leaving him behind. My, my personal favorite part, though, is that the music director cast himself as Orpheus, the best singer, best songwriter ever. I'm not sh quite sure why this particular story is so enduring, particularly because people still go gaga over Romeo and Juliet and Pyramus and Thisbe are, like, right there. Maybe people just really like casting themselves as the best singer-songwriter who ever lived. Where the real road lies between your ears behind your eyes that is the path to paradise likewise the road to ruin so i hope you enjoyed this story about lost lovers and being torn apart by the mayonnaise if you have any comments as always i would love to hear from you and you better subscribe while you're down there because you don't want to miss next week's work of classic literature i'll see you guys next time